Section nine of John Brown by W. E. B. Du Bois. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter seven. The Swamp of the Swan. Part two. Early next morning, the party pressed on until they came in sight of the town. Brown would not enter, but sent a messenger ahead, and the narrator continues as he wrung my hand at parting he urged that we should have the legislature meet resist all who should interfere with it and fight if necessary even the united states troops he had told me the night before of his visit to many of the fortifications in europe and criticized them sharply holding that modern warfare did away with them and that a well-armed brave soldier was the best fortification he criticized all the arms then in use and showed me a fine repeating rifle which he said would carry eight hundred yards but he added the way to fight is to press to close quarters the topeka journey was in vain the legislature quietly dispersed at the command of colonel sumner and john brown saw that his only hope of stirring up effective resistance lay in lane's army of immigrants then approaching the northern boundaries of kansas with whom was his son-in-law's brother taking therefore his wounded son-in-law and leaving his band he pressed forward alone on a dangerous and wearisome way of one hundred and fifty miles through the enemy's country hinton saw him as he rode into one of the camps and says have you a man in your camp named william thompson you are from massachusetts young man i believe and mr thompson joined you at buffalo these words were addressed to me by an elderly man riding a worn-looking gaunt gray horse it was on a late july day and in its hottest hours i had been idly watching a wagon and one horse toiling slowly northward across the prairie along the emigrant trail that had been marked out by free state men under command of sam walker and aaron d stevens who was then known as colonel whipple john brown whose name the young and ardent had begun to conjure with and swear by had been described to me so as i heard the question i looked up and met the full strong gaze of a pair of luminous questioning eyes somehow i instinctively knew this was john brown and with that name i replied saying that thompson was in our company it was a long rugged featured face i saw a tall sinewy figure too he had dismounted five feet eleven i estimated with square shoulders narrow flank sinewy and deep-chested a frame full of nervous power but not impressing one especially with muscular vigor the impression left by the pose and the figure was that of reserve endurance and quiet strength the questioning voice tones were mellow magnetic and grave on the weather-worn face was a stubby short gray beard evidently of recent growth this figure unarmed poorly clad with coarse linen trousers tucked into high heavy cowhide boots with heavy spurs on their heels a cotton shirt opened at the throat a long torn linen duster and a berayed chip straw hat he held in his hand as he waited for thompson to reach us made up the outward garb and appearance of john brown when i first met him in ten minutes his mounted figure disappeared over the north horizon pushing on northward brown found asylum for his wounded follower at tabor iowa returning he joined the main body of lane's men at nebraska city here again arose divided councils radical leaders like lane and brown were proscribed men and united states troops stood on the borders of iowa to prevent the entrance of armed bodies it was decided therefore that lane must not enter with the immigrants and a letter to this effect was brought to him by samuel walker a free state leader walker says after reading it he sat for a long time with his head bowed and the tears running down his cheeks finally he looked up and said walker if you say the people of kansas don't want me it's all right and i'll blow my brains out i can never go back to the states and look the people in the face and tell them that as soon as i got these kansas friends of mine fairly into danger i had to abandon them i can't do it no matter what i say in my own defense no one will believe it i'll blow my brains out and end the thing right here general said i the people of kansas would rather have you than all the party at nebraska city i have got fifteen good boys that are my own 
if you will put yourself under my orders i'll take you through all right thus walker lane and john brown with a party of thirty stole into kansas and started anew the flame of civil war brown's old company organized early in eighteen fifty eight was mounted and brought to the front and a systematic effort was made by lane to free lawrence from its beleaguering forts the first attack was directed against franklin on the night of august twelfth and as ex-senator atchison of missouri indignantly reported three hundred abolitionists under this same brown attacked the town of franklin robbed plundered and burned took all the arms in town broke open and destroyed the post office captured the old cannon sacramento which our gallant missourians captured in mexico and are now turning its mouth against our friends two days later the little army turned southward to fort saunders lane deployed his forces before it with john brown's cavalry on his right wing a charge was ordered and the garrison fled to the woods leaving an untasted dinner and large stores of goods on august sixteenth fort titus on the road to lecompton was besieged with cannon and finally fired by a load of hay colonel titus a georgian was captured and john brown and other leaders wanted to hang him for he was one of the most brutal of the border ruffian commanders sam walker however saved his neck so furious had been this short campaign that the pro-slavery party sued for a truce walker tells how on the following day governor shannon and major sedgwick came to lawrence to negotiate an exchange of prisoners they held about thirty of our men and we forty of theirs it was agreed to swap even we surrendering all their men including titus they had to hand over all our men and cannon they had captured at the sacking of lawrence i insisted very strongly on this last point of the contract for when the gun was taken i swore i would have it back within six months i had the pleasure of escorting our prisoners to sedgwick's camp and receiving the cannon and the prisoners held by the enemy there in exchange the whirlwind of guerrilla warfare now swept back to the dark ravines of the swamp of the swan after the murders of may came the first counter-attack of early june culminating in the battle of black jack this check quelled the pro-slavery party a while and they began manning the forts around lawrence on august fifth the free state men struck a retaliating blow while john brown was absent in nebraska although he was credited with being present by the missouri newspapers similar skirmishes followed and the advantage was now so completely with the free state forces that a final crushing blow was planned by the slave party of missouri manifestos swept the state and no quarter was the motto the missourians responded with alacrity and a great mass crossed the border divided into two wings the lesser attacked osawatomie and a newspaper in missouri said the attack on osawatomie was by part of an army of eleven hundred and fifty men of whom atchison was major-general general reed with two hundred and fifty men and one piece of artillery moved on to attack osawatomie he arrived near that place and was attacked by two hundred abolitionists under the command of the notorious john brown who commenced firing upon reed from thick chaparral four hundred yards off general reed made a successful charge killing thirty-one and taking seven prisoners among the killed was frederick brown the notorious john brown was also killed by a pro-slavery man named white in attempting to cross the moray de Signes. the pro-slavery party have five wounded on the same day captain hayes with forty men attacked the house of the notorious ottawa jones burned it and killed two abolitionists jones fled to the cornfield was shot by hayes and is believed to be dead but john brown was not dead and was ever after known as osawatomie brown he wrote home september seventh saying i have one moment to write to you to say that i am yet alive that jason and family were well yesterday john and family i hear are well he being yet a prisoner on the morning of the thirtieth of august an attack was made by the ruffians on osawatomie numbering some four hundred by whose scouts our dear frederick was shot dead without warning he supposing them to be free state men as near as we can learn one other man a cousin of mr adair was murdered by them about the same time that frederick was killed 
and one badly wounded at the same time at this time i was about three miles off where i had some fourteen or fifteen men overnight that i had just enlisted to serve under me as regulars these i collected as well as i could with some twelve or fifteen more and in about three-quarters of an hour i attacked them from a wood with thick undergrowth with this force we threw them into confusion for about fifteen or twenty minutes during which time we killed or wounded from seventy to eighty of the enemy as they say and then we escaped as well as we could with one killed while escaping two or three wounded and as many more missing four or five free state men were butchered during the day in all jason fought bravely by my side during the fight and escaped with me he being unhurt i was struck by a partly spent grape canister or rifle shot which bruised me some but did not injure me seriously hitherto the lord has helped me a cheer went up from all free kansas over this vigorous defense and for once there was unanimity among the leaders of the free state cause robinson the wariest of them wrote i cheerfully accord to you my heartfelt thanks for your prompt efficient and timely action against the invaders of our rights and the murderers of our citizens history will give your name a proud place on her pages and posterity will pay homage to your heroism in the cause of god and humanity meantime the missourians after their hard-won victory hastened back to join the larger wing of the invaders and so disconcerting was their report that when lane made a feint against them they started to retreat governor woodson's call for the territorial militia however heartened them and gave them legal standing by september fifteenth they were threatening kansas again with nearly three thousand men the nation however was now aroused and the new governor geary with orders to make peace at all costs was hurrying forward among the first whom he summoned to secret conference was john brown brown came to lawrence and was leaving satisfied with geary's promises when the invading army of missourians suddenly appeared before the city he immediately returned to the town where there were only two hundred fighting men he was asked to take command of the defence but declined preferring to act with his usual independence about five o'clock monday the fifteenth he mounted a dry-goods box on main street opposite the post office and spoke to the people gentlemen it is said that there are twenty-five hundred missourians down at franklin and that they will be here in two hours you can see for yourselves the smoke they are making by setting fire to the houses in that town now is probably the last opportunity you will have of seeing a fight so that you had better do your best if they should come up and attack us don't yell and make a great noise but remain perfectly silent and still wait until they get within twenty-five yards of you get a good object be sure you see the hind side of your gun then fire a great deal of powder and lead and very precious time is wasted by shooting too high you had better aim at their legs than at their heads in either case be sure of the hind sights of your guns it is from this reason that i myself have so many times escaped for if all the bullets which have ever been aimed at me had hit me i would have been as full of holes as a riddle it was a desperate situation the free state forces were scattered leaving but a handful to face an army but in that handful was john brown and the invaders knew it and advanced cautiously redpath who was with brown says about five o'clock in the afternoon their advance guard consisting of four hundred horsemen crossed the wakarusa and presented themselves in sight of the town about two miles off when they halted and arrayed themselves for battle fearing perhaps to come within too close range of sharp's rifle balls brown's movement now was a little on the offensive order for he ordered out all the sharp's riflemen from every part of the town in all not more than forty or fifty marched them a half mile into the prairie and arranged them three paces apart in a line parallel with that of the enemy and then they lay down upon their faces in the grass awaiting the order to fire the invaders hesitated halted and then retired john brown says 
i know of no possible reason why they did not attack and burn that place except that about one hundred free state men volunteered to go out on the open plain before the town and there give them the offer of a fight which they declined after getting some few scattering shots from our men and then retreated back toward franklin i saw that whole thing the government troops at this time were with governor geary at lecompton a distance of twelve miles only from lawrence and notwithstanding several runners had been to advise him in good time of the approach or of the setting out of the enemy who had to march some forty miles to reach lawrence he did not on that memorable occasion get a single soldier on the ground until after the enemy had retreated back to franklin and had been gone for about five hours he did get the troops there about midnight afterward and that is the way he saved lawrence as he boasts of doing in his message to the bogus legislature this was just the kind of protection the administration and its tools have afforded the free state settlers of kansas from the first it has cost the united states more than a half million for a year past to harass poor free state settlers in kansas and to violate all law and all right moral and constitutional for the sole and only purpose of forcing slavery upon that territory i challenge this whole nation to prove before god or mankind the contrary who paid this money to enslave the settlers of kansas and worry them out i say nothing in this estimate of the money wasted by congress in the management of this horrible tyrannical and damnable affair the withdrawal however was but temporary and it seems hardly possible that lawrence could have escaped a second capture and burning had not geary thrown himself into the breach with great earnestness as he reported fully appreciating the awful calamities that were impending i hastened with all possible dispatch to the encampment assembled the officers of the militia and in the name of the president of the united states demanded a suspension of hostilities i had sent in advance the secretary and adjutant-general of the territory with orders to carry out the letter and spirit of my proclamations but up to the time of my arrival these orders had been unheeded and i discovered but little disposition to obey them i addressed the officers in command at considerable length setting forth the disastrous consequences of such a demonstration as was contemplated and the absolute necessity of more lawful and conciliatory measures to restore peace tranquillity and prosperity to the country i read my instructions from the president and convinced them that my whole course of procedure was in accordance therewith and called upon them to aid me in my efforts not only to carry out these instructions but to support and enforce the laws and the constitution of the united states without doubt geary especially emphasized the fact that another sacking of lawrence would possibly defeat buchanan and elect fremont what chance would there be then for the pro-slavery party the missourians were thus induced to retreat partly by geary's logic partly perhaps by john brown's resolute handling of his patently inadequate but nevertheless efficient force they marched back home leaving a trail of flame and ashes the last and largest missouri invasion of kansas the culmination and failure of the pro-slavery policy of force geary now began successfully to cope with the kansas situation his most puzzling problem was john brown and his ilk his experience soon led him to see the righteousness of the free state cause but he had to insist on law and order even under the bogus laws promising equitable treatment in the future immediately the free state party split into its old divisions the small body of irreconcilables like john brown who were fighting slavery in kansas and everywhere and the far larger mass of compromisers like robinson whose only object was to make a free state of kansas and who were willing to concede all else under such circumstances the best move was to get rid of john brown to have sought to arrest him would have precipitated civil war again could he not be induced quietly to leave on promise of immunity 
accordingly geary issued a warrant against brown but gave it to the hands of the friendly samuel walker whom he had previously asked to warn the old man brown was not loath his work in kansas so far as he could then see was done the state was bound to be free and further than that few kansans cared they had no enmity towards slavery as such which called them to a crusade far from regarding negroes as brothers they disliked them and were willing to disenfranchise them and crowd them from the state among such folk there was no place for john brown his greater mission called him kansas had been an interlude only although for a time he hoped to make it the chief battleground now he knew better and again the alleghanies beckoned to be sure he owed kansas much here he had passed through his baptism of fire and he had offered the sacrifice of blood to his god he was sterner stuff now ready to go whithersoever the master called and he heard him calling not only had he learned a method of warfare in kansas he had learned to know a band of simple honest young fellows hot with the wine of youth hero worshippers ready to do and dare in a great cause thus the worst difficulties of the past disappeared and the way lay clear only one thing oppressed him he was old and sick a tired toil-racked man could he live and do the lord's will his company of regulators was formally disbanded but left spiritually intact and he started north late in september eighteen fifty six taking with him his four sons john jr who had at last been released jason salmon and oliver and also true to his cause a fugitive slave whom he had chanced upon as he moved northward the united states troops unaware of geary's diplomacy shadowed and all but captured him yet he passed safely through their very midst with his old wagon and cow in the hidden slave displaying his surveyor's instruments thus silently john brown disappeared from kansas and for a year nothing was heard of him in his former haunts only his near friends knew that he had gone eastward and a few of them hinted at his great mission matters moved swiftly in kansas there was more and more evident a free state majority but would the pro-slavery administration let it be counted the new governor was trying to save something for his masters but the irreconcilables of the lane and john brown type doubted it i bless god wrote brown in april that he has not left the free state men of kansas to pollute themselves by the foul and loathsome embrace i have been trembling all along lest they might back down from the high and holy ground they have taken i say in view of the wisdom firmness and patience of my friends and fellow sufferers in the cause of humanity let the lord's name be eternally praised notwithstanding this attitude of many of the free state party they were prevailed upon to vote in the state election of october eighteen fifty seven as a concession however lane was appointed to guard the ballot boxes and hearing that john brown was back again in iowa he sent for him in hot haste his messengers found the old man sick and disappointed among his staunch quaker friends at tabor brown offered to come if supplied with three good teams with well-covered wagons and ten really ingenious industrious not gassy men with about one hundred and fifty dollars in cash these demands were not met until too late so that brown returned the money and did not appear in kansas until the election was over and the free state forces had triumphed this had now but passing interest for him he had other objects in kansas and flitted noiselessly about among the picked men who had promised their aid then he disappeared again eight months passed away when suddenly another kansas outrage startled the nation it was the last vengeful echo of that first night of murder in the swamp of the swan in eighteen fifty six lynn and bourbon counties some miles below the original brown settlement had been cleared of free state settlers in eighteen fifty seven these settlers ventured to return and found the pro-slavery forces centered at fort scott waiting for congress to pass the lecompton constitution thus in eighteen fifty seven and eighteen fifty eight the expiring horror of kansas guerrilla warfare centered in southeast kansas 
the pro-slavery forces saw the state slipping from them but they determined by desperate blows to plant slavery so deeply in the counties next to missouri that no free state majority could possibly uproot it to accomplish this it was necessary again to drive off the free state settlers there ensued a series of bloody reprisals culminating in may eighteen fifty eight two years after the first may massacre a georgian with a remnant of buford's band again rode down amid the calm silent beauty of the swamp of the swan they gathered eleven unarmed farmers from their fields and homes and marched them to a gloomy ravine near snyder's blacksmith shop there the party killed four and badly wounded six others leaving them all for dead the echoes of this last desperate blow had scarcely died before john brown appeared on the scene and attempted to buy and fortify the very blacksmith shop where the murders were done he writes to eastern friends i am here with about ten of my men located on the same quarter section where the terrible murders of the nineteenth of may were committed called the hamilton or trading post murders deserted farms and dwellings lie in all directions for some miles along the line and the remaining inhabitants watch every appearance of persons moving about with anxious jealousy and vigilance four of the persons wounded or attacked on that occasion are staying with me the blacksmith snyder who fought the murderers with his brother and son are of the number old mr hairgrove who was terribly wounded at the same time is another the blacksmith returned here with me and intends to bring back his family on to his claim within two or three days a constant fear of new trouble seems to prevail on both sides of the line and on both sides are companies of armed men any little affair may open the quarrel afresh two murders and cases of robbery are reported of late i have also a man with me who fled from his family and farm in missouri but a day or two since his life being threatened on account of being accused of informing kansas men of the whereabouts of one of the murderers who was lately taken and brought to this side i have concealed the fact of my presence pretty much lest it should tend to create excitement but it is getting leaked out and will soon be known to all as i am not here to seek or secure revenge i do not mean to be the first to reopen the quarrel how soon it may be raised against me i cannot say nor am i over anxious he quickly had fifteen of his former companions in arms organized as shubal morgan's company under the old regulations and he eagerly sought out and cooperated with captain montgomery the vigil was long and wearisome i had lain every night without shelter he writes suffering from cold rains and heavy dews together with the oppressive heat of the days hinton met brown at this time and found him not only unwell but somewhat more impatient and nervous in his manner than i had ever before observed soon after my arrival he remarked again in conversation as to the various public men in the territory captain montgomery's name was introduced and i inquired how mr brown liked him the captain was quite enthusiastic in praise of him avowing a most perfect confidence in his integrity and purposes captain montgomery he said is the only soldier i have met among the prominent kansas men he understands my system of warfare exactly he is a natural chieftain and knows how to lead of his own early treatment at the hands of ambitious leaders to which i alluded in bitter terms he said they acted up to their instincts as politicians they thought every man wanted to lead and therefore supposed i might be in the way of their schemes while they had this feeling of course they opposed me many men did not like the manner in which i conducted warfare and they too opposed me committees and councils could not control my movements therefore they did not like me but politicians and leaders soon found that i had different purposes and forgot their jealousy they have all been kind to me since further conversation ensued relative to the free state struggle in which i criticizing the management of it from an anti-slavery point of view pronounced it an abortion captain brown looked at me with a peculiar expression in the eyes as if struck by the word and in an amusing manner remarked abortion yes that's the word 
for twenty years he said i have never made any business arrangement which would prevent me at any time answering the call of the lord i have kept my business in such a condition that in two weeks i could always wind up my affairs and be ready to obey the call i have permitted nothing to be in the way of my duty neither my wife children nor worldly goods whenever the occasion offered i was ready the hour is very near at hand and all who are willing to act should be ready during the fall john brown cooperated with montgomery in his guerrilla warfare and laid out miniature fortifications with his men while he himself was not personally present in montgomery's fights he usually helped plan them and sent his men along meantime winter set in and john brown knew that hostilities would cease once again he turned to his long and exasperatingly interrupted life work just after the famous raid on fort scott he had a chance not only to begin his greater work but to strike a blow at slavery right in kansas hinton says on the sunday following the expedition of fort scott as i was scouting down the line i ran across a colored man whose ostensible purpose was the selling of brooms he soon solved the problem as to the propriety of making a confidant of me and i found that his name was jim daniels that his wife self and babies belonged to an estate and were to be sold at administrator's sale in the immediate future his present business was not of selling brooms particularly but to find help to get himself family and a few friends in the vicinity away from these threatened conditions daniels was a fine-looking mulatto i immediately hunted up brown and it was soon arranged to go the following night and give what assistance we could i am sure that brown in his mind was just waiting for something to turn up or in his way of thinking was expecting or hoping that god would provide him a basis of action when this came he hailed it as heaven sent john brown himself told the story in the new york tribune not one year ago eleven quiet citizens of this neighborhood william robertson william kolpetzer amos hall austin hall john campbell asa snyder thomas stillwell william hairgrove asa hairgrove patrick ross and b l reed were gathered up from their work in their homes by an armed force under one hamilton and without trial or opportunity to speak in their own defence were formed into line and all but one shot five killed and five wounded one fell unharmed pretending to be dead all were left for dead the only crime charged against them was that of being free state men now i inquire what action has ever since the occurrence in may last been taken by either the president of the united states the governor of missouri the governor of kansas or any of their tools or by any pro-slavery or administration man to ferret out and punish the perpetrators of this crime now for the other parallel on sunday december nineteenth a negro man called jim came over to osage settlement from missouri and stated that he together with his wife two children and other negro man was to be sold within a day or two and begged for help to get away on monday the following night two small companies were made up to go to missouri and forcibly liberate the five slaves together with other slaves one of these companies i assumed to direct we proceeded to the place surrounding the buildings liberated the slaves and also took certain property supposed to belong to the estate we however learned before leaving that a portion of the articles we had belonged to a man living on the plantation as a tenant and who was supposed to have no interest in the estate we promptly returned to him all we had taken we then went to another plantation where we found five more slaves took some property and two white men we all moved slowly away into the territory for some distance and then sent the white men back telling them to follow us as soon as they chose to do so the other company freed one female slave took some property and as i am informed killed one white man the master who fought against the liberation now for comparison eleven persons are forcibly restored to their natural and inalienable rights with but one man killed and all hell is stirred from beneath 
it is currently reported that the governor of missouri has made a requisition upon the governor of kansas for the delivery of all such as were concerned in the last named dreadful outrage the marshal of kansas is said to be collecting a posse of missouri not kansas men at west point in missouri a little town about ten miles distant to enforce the laws all pro-slavery conservative free state and doe-face men and administration tools are filled with holy horror one of the slaves samuel harper afterward told of this wonderful catabasis of a thousand miles in the teeth of the elements and in defiance of the law it was mighty slow travelling you see there were several different parties amongst our band and our masters had people looking all over for us we would ride all night and then maybe we would have to stay several days in one house to keep from getting caught in a month we had only got to a place near topeka which was about forty miles from where we started there was twelve of us at the one house of a man named doyle besides the captain and his men when there came along a gang of slave hunters one of captain brown's men stevens he went down to them and said gentlemen you look as if you were looking for somebody or something ay yes says the leader we think as how you have some of our slaves up yonder in that there house is that so says stevens well come on right along with me and you can look them over and see we were watching this here conversation all the time and when we see stevens coming up to the house with that there man we just didn't know what to make of it we began to get scared that stevens was going to give us to them slave hunters but the looks of things changed when stevens got up to the house he just opened the door long enough for to grab a double-barreled gun he pointed it at the slave hunter and says you want to see your slaves does you well just look up them barrels and see if you can find them that man just went all to pieces he dropped his gun his legs went trembling and the tears most started from his eyes stevens took and locked him up in the house when the rest of his crowd seen him captured they ran away as fast as they could go captain brown went to see the prisoner and says to him i'll show you what it is to look after slaves my man that frightened the prisoner awful he was a kind of old fellow and when he heard what the captain said i suppose he thought he was going to be killed he began to cry and beg to be let go the captain he only smiled a little bit and talked some more to him and the next day he was let go a few days afterward the united states marshal came up with another gang to capture us there was about seventy-five of them and they surrounded the house and we was afraid we was all going to be took for sure but the captain he just said get ready boys and we'll whip them all there was only fourteen of us altogether but the captain was a terror to them and when he stepped out of the house and went for them the whole seventy-five of them started running captain brown and Caggy and some others chased them and captured five prisoners there was a doctor and lawyer amongst them they all had nice horses the captain made them get down then he told five of us slaves to mount the beasts and we rode them while the white men had to walk it was early in the spring and the mud on the roads was away over their ankles i just tell you it was mighty tough walking and you can believe those fellows had enough of slave hunting the next day the captain let them all go our masters kept spies watching till we crossed the border when we got to springdale iowa a man came to see captain brown and told him there was a lot of friends down in a town in kansas that wanted to see him the captain said he did not care to go down but as soon as the man started back captain brown followed him when he came back he said there was a whole crowd coming up to capture us we all went up to the schoolhouse and got ourselves ready to fight the crowd came and hung around the schoolhouse a few days but they didn't try to capture us the governor of kansas he telegraphed to the united states marshal at springdale capture john brown dead or alive the marshal he answered if i try to capture john brown it'll be dead and i'll be the one that'll be dead finally those kansas people went home and then that same marshal put us in a car and sent us to chicago it took us over three months to get to canada what kind of a man was captain brown he was a great big man over six feet tall with great big shoulders and long hair white as snow 
he was a very quiet man awful quiet he never even laughed after we was free we was wild of course and we used to cut up all kinds of foolishness but the captain would always look as solemn as a graveyard sometimes he just let out the tiniest bit of a smile and says you'd better quit your fooling and take up your book on the twelfth of march eighteen fifty nine nearly three months after the starting john brown landed his fugitive safely in canada under the lion's paw the old man lifted his hands and said lord permit thy servant to die in peace for mine eyes have seen thy salvation i could not brook the thought that any ill should befall you least of all that you should be taken back to slavery the arm of jehovah protected us End of section 9